So 2020 has come and gone, the year that was just, just shit. But a big thing that has helped me get through this year, as well as I'm sure many others, is video games, movies, all the kind of media that we can consume at home. And video games are a big part of that, so let's have a look at my favourite ones of the year. But before that, I do just want to give a few shout-outs to some games that didn't come out this year, that have actually just really kept me engaged, and just I've poured a lot of time into. And it's been in a year like this, where we just want the normality to come back as quickly as possible, that's a good thing. So, let's give a shout-out to a few of these games right now. So here's a few games that I didn't that I played this year but they didn't come out this year and when I'm thinking about it there's only really two but <laughs> uh, there's Witcher 3 which came out last year which has become one of my ultimate uh, favorite games of all time now just an incredible game altogether I don't really have many faults of it I mean it can be quite buggy in places but it's just masterful the rest of it the music the characters the story it was the game that taught me that Western RPGs can do a focused story without having to make the side quests all fetchy or make the side quests really interesting but make the main quest really boring. It nailed everything. The expansions which come in the complete edition for the Switch was fantastic. Yeah, I can't really say much more than, uh, otherwise I go on for bloody ever, but yeah, Witcher 3 definitely made itself one of my favourite games of all time now. It's a big thanks to that game because it, it definitely took around like two to 300 hours of my life away for that. And secondly is Minecraft. It's it, Minecraft was a game that I haven't played in quite a lot of years now. I didn't play it uh, since, pro I didn't play it properly since around 2012. So it was really nice getting into a realm this time with a lot of my friends who were playing on different systems. So we was all able to create our own world and go on our own adventures together and just have a good time to be honest. And you know, Minecraft's a huge time sink anyway, uh, but when you're with friends, you can end up doing all sorts of wacky stuff. Yeah, I'm really pleased with how our world turned out this year and uh, all the things that we were able to get up to. And I mean, we're still not done, like, it's still something that we go back to every now and then. But yeah, Minecraft was a big one this year, especially in the summertime, but that was probably like one of my main focuses for a while. So yeah, big ups to Minecraft, the, the game that keeps on giving, apparently. But before we get into the main games that came out this year, I do just want to stress again, uh, like previous years, that I'm talking from mainly a Switch perspective. I don't own a PS4, 4, 5, or Xbox One, or Xbox Series One X, or whatever fucking name it is now. I don't own any of those, so any exclusives that came out on that, on those consoles, they won't be here, uh, like Ghost of Tsushima or Last of Us, because I don't own the system. So uh, I also do want to just trust that I did pick up Immortals Phoenix Rising for Christmas, but I won't be able to give a verdict on it because I'm uh, not not too far into it. And, Unlike last year, which I, there were so many games last year that um, I talked about, this year there wasn't as many, and I'm not going to talk about the games that I got this year but didn't really put any time into. So, uh, this year, all the games I talk about uh, I've completed or I've beaten at least to have a full opinion on. So, let's get into it. Now, I kind of don't want to spoil what my game of the year is already, but I'm going to. And the reason for that is if you know me at all, it's not going to be suspenseful what my game of the year was at all. So I'm just going to say it out right now. My game of the year is Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. I've actually got the collector's set up there somewhere uh, with the vinyl and all that good stuff. Uh, the reason why I'm just telling you that is because it is my favourite game of all time. And as soon as I knew that the remake was coming out, I just knew straight away that it was going to be my game of the year. If they managed to pull it off in a way that was um, respectful to the original game while well, maybe improving on some things, uh, if I'm honest, I just thought it was going to be a graphical overhaul. I was, I was going to be pleased with it regardless. But they went the extra mile in quite a few areas and also maybe didn't go far enough in some areas. So the things that I that absolutely love about the game is, I mean, everything that makes it my favourite game of all time. The story, the characters, the music, my god, the music. <laughs> the locations, the lore of the world. This world that they've created is just so immersive and endearing and just so interesting. And... Uh, Originally, the original Xenoblade Chronicles came out in a time where... I mean, this is going to sound quite sad, I think, but it came out in a time of my life where things were just changing so much. Uh, I would ju I just left uh, secondary school, and I was going into college, and I had such a close-knit friend group in secondary school that when you go off to college, we sort of... I mean, we were still, like, you know, friends in, in that group, but we were going our own ways and trying to find our own way in the world, you know, where we're going next and all this thing. It wasn't like we all went to the same place together or anything like that. So it was a bit difficult because, you know, you see some friends um, doing one thing and you're thinking, ah, oh, crap, you know, I'm not I'm not really getting anywhere. Um, or you see some friends that are lagging behind and you're like, uh, you want to help them out or, you know, just 
everyone was sort of doing their own thing and um, it was a time where we that, that closeness that was once there wasn't as much anymore and it was hard for me because I, I really like having a, a big group of friends so when I got Xenoblade Chronicles it just took me into this world of these amazing characters that felt so real in this amazing story in this incredible adventure and that's what really I think I think it came out at the right time for me to really love it and I've loved it ever since though like it's not like I have the the rose tinted glasses on like i've played it many times all the way through absolutely bloody love it and this remastered edition came with a load of new features one of the things that i think makes the original game feel dated and this is the only way i think it feels dated is one some of the i guess stiff ca character animations but and, and that's because with the game they didn't make it from scratch they just um, updated the textures and made new models for the characters but they didn't make the new models they made the new models from scratch, but they sort of like layered them over the original models, or the original models' actions. So the newer models still have this sort of rigid animation in some aspects, but I mean the cutscenes still look great. It's more like where they're talking in-game, like, and they'll do the, the classic Pokemon swivel and then walk away, but it still looks better than like Pokemon Sword and Shield, so no worries there. But that's not a huge deal to me, to be honest, because I think even when the time it came out, for JRPG standards, the animations were... Uh, really really good. So that's one way that it's dated. The other way is probably the amount of fetch quests um, in that game. There's a really there's a lot of quests in Xenoblade Chronicles and a lot of them do feel very fetchy. But that's been sort of alleviated by the quest tracker that's been put in this game. So now you can track a quest or track a quest items and it'll tell you exactly on the map where you need to go or more importantly for the collectibles quests which are pieces of shit you find these randomly um, spawning items in the world like these random orbs that could potentially be the item you want now if you manage to track a quest and it's a collectible it'll just tell you which orbs are which, which ones you need and it makes so many of the quests a lot less tedious and grindy that that's probably the biggest improvement of the game to be honest in terms of uh, quality of life updates they also remastered the soundtrack which was i was skeptical of because the original soundtrack is amazing but when they told us that you'd be able to switch back to the original music if you wanted to i was like you know what do what you want then because if the re new music i'm you know if i'm not a fan of the new music i can always go back to the old music but they 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 nailed the remastered soundtrack almost all the tracks i think i like better in remastered which is a big thing for me because like I said I was a bit skeptical on the soundtrack the only um, not, not all of the, the soundtrack uh, not also all of the tracks are remastered but like I would say like a good but like, there's only like a few ones that aren't remastered the only one that I would say I didn't like as much as the original was an obstacle in our path which is a shame because that's one of my favorite songs in the original game uh, it's the boss theme the, the normal boss theme if uh, anyone's wondering I don't know it just sounds kind of it reminded me a bit of the you know like when you have kazoo memes of like famous songs, like the Jurassic Park kazoo theme. It reminded me a bit of that at first. Once it gets going, the song's really good, and I did get used to it, but I do prefer how the original sounded. But don't get me wrong like that, the Real Master soundtrack I had on for the whole game, because it's uh, absolutely incredible. The only other thing I wish they added to the main game was voice acting for Heart to Hearts. I, I know that was probably a big a tall order, and I, you know, I, I'm not too fussed about it, but when you go to Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and all the Heart to Hearts and that, um, game of voice it makes them so much more exciting to to view than in Xenoblade Chronicles so uh, yeah that was a big one of mine unfortunately it didn't come true but I'm not too fussed about it you also have new things like the challenge mode that came from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 you now uh, are able to get extra costumes more fun costumes for the uh, for the cast which is really cool I, I don't think it's as in-depth as the challenge mode from 2 but I kind of like that I kind of like it's a bit more streamlined in this game that might be because the battle system's just not as complicated, but yeah. <laughs> and the main thing that was added to the game was the epilogue, Future Connected. Now, I, when I heard this, because um, at first we saw the Bionis shoulder in the main trailer, I believe, and everyone was like, oh, whoa, because the Bionis shoulder was a cut piece of content from the original game. And it's this big area that's all made, it just doesn't really have anything in it. So they took that and sort of repurposed it and made it into an epilogue. Which I thought was a... If they're going to put the Bionis shoulder in the game, was a smart move, because... If they put in the area just somewhere randomly in the main game, they'd have to get all the voice actors back to have cutscenes in that area to make it seem like an actual you know area in the game. And I don't know where they'd put it either because I think the game is so well paced in terms of the areas you visit that if they put in just another big area, I think it might lose something. Luckily, they did repurpose it into an epilogue. 
and um, I was worried because Xenoblade Chronicles has a perfect ending and it's all self-contained, it doesn't really need an epilogue, so I was like, oh, please don't ruin it. But, but they didn't, they didn't ruin it, it was really, really, really well done. It's about Melia and Shulk. Melia arguably had more story to tell in the original game and they really did do well with their character here. It was really cool hearing Jenna Coleman come back to reprise her role as Melia because I was, I was convinced she would not be able to come back because um, after her roles in like Doctor Who and, and that one where she plays the Queen or something. I thought she would have been too expensive to get back. Adam Howden as Shulk is always is great. He's always down to come back as Shulk, which is great. I will say it, it took a while. I mean, actually, no, it didn't really take a while. They kind of never really got into it, but you can definitely tell that they're older now. Adam Howden does the best he can, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming Jenna did too. You can tell that they haven't played these characters for a long time, and to be honest, that might help because the epilogue is set uh, like a year or two after the main game. But it is something you have to go in like expecting. Like it is the same character, they do. It's the same voice, but if you go into the epilogue straight after the main game you are definitely going to notice a difference there, especially with Melia. But the other two characters that come along with you are Ricky's kids, which are Nino and... Nino and... No, no, wait. Kino and Nino. Sorry, Jesus. So many K's and N's. <laughs> but I love those two. They were Ricky's kids, so it was a really cool dynamic to have Melia and Shulk babysit these kids who have like snuck aboard the uh, junk ship. The main story of the epilogue is to get back to Alchemov because um, Alchemov has sort of been lost and they've located it and uh, they're going to try and reclaim it. I, I believe, I believe that's the story. And then they come across some other, I won't spoil the, the epilogue for anyone who hasn't played it yet, but a lot of people were hoping that, for all what I'd seen, uh, quite a few people have wanted it to sort of allude to what's coming next in the Xenoblade series and I also thought it might do a bit of that and there's very few snippets of it, there's like very few snippets of what could happen or you know, what is connected or that kind of thing but it's not really about that and I think some people could be disappointed by that. I really like the epilogue, it's just another story in, in this world of these characters that I love. I did get teary at the end because it had a piano rendition of Beyond the Sky and I absolutely adore that song. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, the Heart to Hearts, they're fully voiced in this game as well. Although they, they're not called Heart to Hearts in the epilogue, they're called um, Quiet Moments, I believe. Uh, which is ironic, because they speak, but... <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I really loved it. I do think they could have done the, the Pond Spectre chain attack, switcheroo. There's no longer a chain attack in, in um, Future Connected, you have uh, these Pond Spectre moves now. I do think that could have been done a bit better, mainly because you don't really get access to these powerful attacks until near the end of... Uh, the epilogue. Uh, it can make the first half of it feel a bit... It, it can make it a bit more mechanically weak than the main game because uh, Shulk no longer has his visions or anything like that so yeah it can feel a bit stilted in that aspect but I mean I loved it. It was more Xenoblade. I fucking love Xenoblade so I will never say no more um, no to more of it. And that's, you know, that's all in one package now, so if you are ever been interested in Xenoblade at all, definitely get the Definitive Edition. I actually believe it's going for cheaper than uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 at the moment, so definitely look into getting it, because, like I said, my favourite game of all time, the Definitive Edition is the definitive way to play it, and I think I nearly 100% it again, actually, which, uh, I, in the original game, I had to go through wikis and wikis to try and find out where this character was so I could talk to them and all that. In Definitive Edition, you don't need any of that. I don't think I had to look up the wiki once. The only thing that is, you can't track certain collectibles when it's not in a quest, which is a bit crappy. But apart from that, Definitive Edition has got everything you need right there in the game, as well as a really cool epilogue story. So, there it is. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition B5 out of B5. So, next up is the weirdest game I've played this year, and one of the weirdest games I think I've ever played, and that is Hypnospace Outlaw. Okay, I've tried describing this game to quite a few of my friends and it's just... I don't know how I can get it across how amazing this game is. Okay, here we go. So, essentially the game is a, a parody of a 90s, like 95, 98 Windows uh, Internet Explorer. Or just an internet browser in general. The way it works is people put on this headband when they go to sleep. Um, and then they can log into this computer network that... I think it's called Sleep Time Computing, so you, you access it while you're asleep. But essentially that's just an excuse to sort of make this game what it is, which like I said is this really wacky 90s parody of an internet browser. And if you're someone from that time period especially, you can really just feel that they nailed everything here. Uh, they nailed the, the weird little flash animations and the weird um, home pages and personal pages. Of, you can see the way that people talk and the way that culture was and 
the the music, the sounds of this game are freaking incredible. Not just the music for you know certain web pages and stuff like that, which like I said, nail the atmosphere completely and just pull you into this. It, that's this is the thing about this game. Like when I played it, I don't usually binge games much anymore but this game took me in and I was on it for hours and hours and hours for like four days until I ended up beating it. Just going through all these different pages and because essentially the game is a detective uh, game, you, you're a moderator for this, this browser and uh, you'll get assigned new tasks to do. Like you'll uh, get assigned to copyright strike these images of this this fish, this uh, gumshoe gooper, I think his name is, and I think it's one of the first cases you have to do because I don't want to spoil anything in this game really because a lot of a lot of the fun of this game is discovering stuff by yourself. It's kind of like when you play a game like Metroid Prime, for example, and most of the game's story comes from those optional logs you can find, and it just when you find it yourself, it makes it feel so much more impactful, and you just like you pulled in much more because it feels like you're the one doing all this and that's how this game feels, that's how Hypnospace feels uh, because there's not only a million loads of pages to find and, and scroll through and uh, just so many funny things but there's also uh, people, there's the, there are actually people using this browser, this software and there's time skips in the game so you'll be able to see how they develop and how they interact with other users of the, the uh, software and that there's this one uh, woman, the, the gumshoe gooper woman, she's put up pictures of this fish from like, children in her class and you have to copy strike all of them because you're not allowed to show anything that bears the likeness of this fish on this web, on this uh, browser. And then not long after that you can see that she's seen you copyright strike this and she's part of this group called Good Time Valley and it's all these old timers who don't really know the way the internet works and that want to bring their country back and they're all really patriotic, it's great, there's a few pages of the, just old men with motorbikes and just really stereotypical uh, old people which is really funny to see and they nail the music for that as well they nail the music for everything in this game but later on when you time skip you'll be able to see that she's actually started up a protest against hypnospace for copyright striking pictures of this fish from her class and just seeing the world develop like that is just so engrossing and another one is this kid called Zane and he's this like bully in uh, the Teen Topia bit which is probably my favourite place in the game and it's like all these teens that are just full of angst and really edgy teens from like early, late 90s early 2000s and this Zane is definitely one of them I love the music on his page, it's by this, um, this I guess it's a Linkin Park kind of parody it's just like a Linkin Park T-A-T-U or Tattoo, or whatever that band's called, a parody, got like these really emo-y sort of bands, emo rocky bands, called Seepage. Seepage? I love that, I don't, like, I actually love the music that they've made for this game, they've made actual songs for it, and it, they sound really good, <laughs> like, I was like, I actually, I remember hearing the song on this page the first time, and I was, I heard this, sorry. I fucking love that. <laughs> but it, it nails the things that he's into and he's drawing his own sort of comics and bullying these other kids and you have to report them for harassment but it's like on this secret page so you have to go through these underground internet pages and put two and two together and it is one of the, it's, it's like a puzzle game almost but it's so well done and so interesting. It's one of the best games I've ever played. Definitely, definitely one of the best games I've played this year. Uh, an absolute V5 out of V5. It has got a demo on the eShop, so I don't know how much the demo gives you, but really do. I honestly got to check it out. It's it, it might not seem like it's your kind of game and up your alley, but once you get stuck in and just look at all these weird web pages, you'll you'll find something magical there, definitely. And I even talked about this this weird soundscape system that played this. In your mind's eye. You're on the watery part of Venus, swimming with moon whales. Now, sing to them in their native utterance. And there's also the Chowder Man, this dad rocker kind of guy, but he just, he nails um, the feel from that time period as well, and he's, he's bloody everywhere, and I love some of his songs, and 
I will say now, there's uh, later on in the game, you're able to, after you sort of see how his story goes, you're able to download a music video uh, for a Christmas song that he did. This Christmas song is actually incredible. I, like, legitimately, I love this Christmas song. It's called Christmas Pain in Christmas Town, if you haven't heard it yet, but... I mean, the music video nails the aesthetic and everything in, in every way, but the actual song is not that bad at all. It's actually really good. I had it on my Christmas playlist for this year's Christmas. It was really, really good. I'm not gonna try. I'm not gonna spoil any more of it because I want you to experience it yourself if you can. Download the demo, give it a go. It's absolutely one of my favourite games of the year. Uh, I love it. Hit my face out. Well. So next up is Animal Crossing New Horizons, probably the most important game this year. So Animal Crossing, I have. Such a big love for that series. I remember trying to buy the original GameCube game and the guy at the till at the time was like, you know this game's for girls, right? And I was like, what, what, I mean, what? I, mean, I, think, I think it was my dad who was like, oh, you don't want that, put that back. So I, I didn't end up getting it, which I hated at the time because I think they were selling for super cheap with the memory card as well. I mean, I've got it now. Yeah, I've, I've got it now, but uh, I had to pay more than I would have wanted to for it. Anyway, a year later, I ended up getting a Wild World instead and I love that game. I had a group of friends in, in real life that I was able to play that with. This is the thing about Animal Crossing is I didn't notice until New Leaf that my main love for the series was multiplayer. I love being able to go to other people's towns and interacting with them and making your own house and being able to express yourself in that kind of way. Same thing with Let's Go to the City, except this time it was now online. And that's one of my favourite games of all time and always will be. Always be one of the games that mean the most to me because it's how I met some of my best friends in my life now. Still best friends of them. Uh, nearly a decade later. But then New Leaf came around and it sort of showed me that although it was the best game in the series by far, definitely, I just didn't really have the spark to play it like I once did. I wasn't really getting into it as much. I, although I played more of it than I thought I did when I looked back at my playtime, I think it was like 200 hours or something, I was sort of done with the Animal Crossing series because I didn't play it for years after it had come out. But then this year happened and the hype built up and I was like, you know what? Okay, you've got me. I, I need to relax. Give me the Animal Crossing. And it did kind of, kind of confirm my um, suspicions about how I felt about the series. And although I do love it from a just what it's done for me personally, the game itself I don't really find too much enjoyment in anymore. I do when I play it, but I just feel like it is a big time sink. And like I said, a big reason why I love the series in general was because of the multiplayer aspect. Once New Leaf come out, we were already using Discord and Skype and what have you. It was probably Skype at the time. So we didn't really need to have to go around across to connect anymore. So we didn't really play the multiplayer that much. And that's what how I sort of fell off that game. New Horizons was the same. Uh, the thing is with New Horizons is there is less in the game than there was in New Leaf. It's not the island where you can go and play all those fun mini games with your friends. And you, you sort of created your own mini games and let's go to the city. But I was a bit younger then, so you know, I was sort of more receptive to it, a bit more a bit more imagination going in into the old brain there. But in New Horizons I was very I really did enjoy my first few weeks of it because the game's intro is really dragged out now, so you've always got something to do for at least the first few weeks. I do like that, but once you start getting into the motions again, there is more to do now because you can remap your town in any way that you want. You can move stuff any way you want to, and you have more control over how your town is now than ever before, which is great. I just didn't really care to use it or make use of it, really. My town looks really, honestly, nearly identical to how it was when I first got the game. A big thing for me, though, in this game is that, and I think it's the thing that turned me off, to be honest, the most, is... The way that Nintendo is drip fed content for it, and I've made a comment on this before, I absolutely hate it when they do that, just release the game as it is. Why are you putting in holidays now as updates when they've always just been in the game before, uh, you know, in the game when it launched? And I don't know if that was their plan because they've advertised all these updates and, you know, oh Christmas or Toy Day's coming to Animal Crossing. And, I don't know, I don't like that. It takes me out of the game because it feels like I'm being marketed to. I don't know if I'm just being like an old grouch with that, but... I'd just rather be in the game and think, oh, it's Halloween. I'll go in my town and have a look. I don't want to, you know, open up my phone or what have you and just see a Nintendo like, it's coming, Halloween's coming, everyone get ready. I know that's not really the game's fault, but it is the way that it's being updated. And I've said that I probably won't go back to the game until it's fully updated because I just don't care to hear about all these uh, new things that are being added when it's kind of like all these things were in the previous games from the start. Why are you making such a big deal about adding them again? Like swimming, like crazy red, all these events. You know, there's so much that just wasn't in this game so they could put it in later. And especially at the, at the start of the game, without terraforming, the game felt quite bare. The villagers 
that do feel bad because their personality types have just been watered down so much. I think like now you can have there's more personality types than ever, but like they're, they're grouped now, so three personality types will act in almost exactly the same way. I've got nearly all my island villagers; they're nearly all jocks. It's just it's just boring, and they don't really do much. Like visually, they've got more going on than they ever have done. Like they'll pull weights or um, run around or you know sit on pairs for some reason. But in terms of dialogue and things you can do for them, it's just, there really isn't a lot going on, which is a big shame because in other games, especially in Wild World and Let's Go to the City, not so much, but more so than this game, they just felt like they were more going on. And I don't know if that was my childhood imagination filling in the blanks for me, but in this game, they just feel very, very similar. And it's it's a big shame. And I think a part of it is because they just don't want to upset anyone. So, like, for example, the grouchy villagers, or, you know, the nasty villagers, or whatever they used to be called, they won't berate you anymore. They won't, you know, give that extra spice of life to keep things interesting. And they won't get mad at other villagers. And it just feels like you're in... Is it limbo or purgatory or whatever? It just feels like no one's... They haven't got the same emotion or the same expressions as they had before uh, in, in terms of how they act in their dialogue. Another big thing is Nintendo items. Before, the Animal Crossing series had a ton of Nintendo furniture to get, like the Triforce and the Master Sword and uh, Captain Falcon's Blue Falcon. There's just none of that this time. I don't know if they're planning to put that in later or they didn't put it in for a certain reason, but it's not there and it just feels like, why is this brand new? It's sold millions and millions of copies. It's such a shame that this game in the series is as bare as it is, uh, you know, at launch. I know it's had loads of updates now and I haven't gone back to it in a while, so I probably will find a lot of new stuff when I go back on it. But just put it all in together, you know, with little updates here and there. Don't sprinkle it out like that. Overall, I enjoyed Animal Crossing New Horizons for the time that I played it. I'll, I'll say I, I did, I only liked it, but I did enjoy it. It's a very relaxing game. I just wish it had a few quality of life updates, like uh, crafting. I wish it was quicker and you could do more than one. That's like a massive thing. And that's probably why the game feels like such a time sink now. And I think the fact that breakable items are fine, but the gold versions should not break at all. Like they should be a reward um, and they're not really because they break as well. So stupid. Uh, it has a lot of stupid stuff going into it, but Animal Crossing was fun. B3 out of B5. So next up is another odd one. It's Spongebob! So Spongebob Squarepants Battle for Bikini Bottom High Rehydrated Rehydrated I got this because I love licensed platforming games I mean if you can see most of the videos on my channel uh, You'll see that they're all licensed platformer games really You know Toy Story 2, uh, Monsters Inc. Scare Island, Emperor's New Groove uh, You know all that, these sort of Disney licensed platformers They just they were my childhood they're the games that I played and this Spongebob Bikini Battle Bikini Bottom looked right up my alley. So when they re announced a remastered version, or remake as it is, I thought I'm definitely picking this up, I'm going to give it a go. And it's exactly what I thought it would be. It's a glitchy mess, I guess. The frame rate stutters like no tomorrow. The game does look genuinely really nice, like with its vibrant colours and stuff like that. But these are the quirks that I wanted from this game. Structurally, the game is very much like Mario 64. Uh, you know, you collect these golden spatulas in these sandboxy kind of levels. and. I really like that. I think the premise is really good. I think the level design is great. I think, honestly, that really the game does have a lot going for it. It's just the frame rate stores, especially on the Switch version, which are pretty horrendous sometimes. It almost feels like it isn't finished in some places. And sometimes it does go a bit too far, but for the most part, it's kind of what I wanted in the game because I need my licensed games to be w weird and funky and maybe not work quite right. But at the same time, they've still got good ideas. And SpongeBob Battle of the Bikini Bottom definitely does. There's a few ones later in the game where you're like, oh my god, there's this ball machine that you have to like push the ball along and um, like a m little mousetrap scenario. And it's so janky, but when you finish it, you're just like, oh, thank God. And just, I don't get that from many games anymore, because the games I try to stay with are more polished. And maybe it's because I've been scarred by old licensed games, but this is a really fun return to uh, return to one of those. And the music's great, the voice acting's spot on. I know that they couldn't get Mr. Krabs um, and Mr. Uh, Mermaid Man's voice actors back for this game originally, and they, they kept them for this remake. But it, you need to be faithful to the original game too, so. Uh, yeah, this game was really fun. Um, I, I liked it. I, it was like I said, it's definitely not a masterpiece or anything, but it was a really fun 10 15 hours that I had with it. And I don't know, I probably will play it again at some point, maybe for a video. So, next up is a game that I really kind of berated for years, and I thought, okay, this is the time to give it another go. 
and that's Wonderful 101 Remastered. So I bought the, well I didn't buy it, but I got the original uh, Wonderful 101 demo on the Wii U. Because I heard that Nintendo were publishing it and it was going to be like a big game for the system. And I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, but I hadn't played Bayonetta or... I wasn't really doing many third party games at the time. I was sort of cl sticking close to Nintendo ones. I mean, I know they didn't have a huge amount on the Wii U anyway, but um, I decided to not really get this after the demo. And I learned years later that it's act the demo is actually quite kind of awful on the Wii U. It doesn't really tell you anything like what you're doing. I remember I was turning into like a big ball of jelly and then springing everywhere, but I didn't know what any of these moves did. It turns out the, the jelly's like a a parry, like you know, when the enemy's just about to hit you, you can bounce it back with the jelly. The spring was to dodge last minute, you can get like a bayonet slow down and do combos and stuff. The game didn't tell me that, but um, it's a big shame as well because I had a blast with this game, so I could have play played it many years earlier. I think the Wii U copy is actually pretty rare now, but yeah, it's uh, it's a fantastic platinum game. I would say it probably has the highest highs of any platinum game I've played but also the lowest lows. The game is about uh, these superheroes called the Wonderful uh, Wonder Below and Wonder Red. Wonder, Wonder Red is new to the team and he's you know, sort of trying to fulfill a leadership role. Wonder Blue is kind of like uh, the rebel. They have uh, such a good dynamic, these characters. It's so Japanese and over the top and platinum and everything you'd expect from that company. The Bayonetta set pieces you might be used to. There's definitely equivalent ones in here, if not better. Sometimes they go a bit overboard and that's where I was sort of talking about the uh, lowest lows because sometimes the camera can be really iffy in this game like the depth perception can be a bit odd especially when you have to plat you have to jump between like floating platforms and you can just fall through because you don't really know where you are in you know in uh, comparison to the uh, to the platform also the uh, stick because with your like, second analog stick you can draw shapes to make um, a fist or a sword or a gun and um, you know the special uh, powers that these superheroes have uh, like uh, Wonder Blue has his sword, Wonder Red has his fist So you'll use these to defeat enemies and unlock to, and do different puzzles and stuff like that You also have quick time events with these though and the ones at the start of the game aren't too hard to do Because you know the sword's just a straight line the gun is like an L But like once you end up starting to get like uh, the whip which is like a little squiggle And then you've got claws which is like a little zigzag sometimes the game struggles to register it I actually had quite a bit of trouble trying to get it to register the hammer a lot of the time which is like half sword and then you got to draw around like a, like a up and then like a little C wouldn't really register and sometimes it's hard to get it accurate when when you're in the middle of battle now it does slow down so it's easier for to, you to do it but it still sometimes just doesn't work as well as I think it should but the secrets also like a big reason why I like this game because it's like a top-down uh, fighter so it's, it's a top-down game and you can find more people to bring to your side and the more people you have the bigger you can make your weapons and you can unlock new moves and abilities all the, the cool stuff the, the only thing is with the collectibles is some of them are quite uh, cryptic, which is fine because um, I've got a lot to go back to and explore. The only thing is that you, there's quite a few collectibles, but not all of them you know what they do really. Like you have battle caps, which are like achievements. You have um, these models, which are like models of all the different one double O members, like rare members, because you can find uh, people. If you draw a circle around people, they'll come join your crew for the for that level. But sometimes you can find a rare double one, a one double O member, which is like an actual member, like Wonder Gamer or someone like that, with their own costume and everything. And you can find little models of these, like little trophies, like in Smash, and they're fine. But the ones that I don't understand is the platinum coins. Like you can find these by um, drawing a. It's kind of cool how they've done this. It's kind of an uh, homage to Okami, where you draw a circle around dying plants, and then the plants will spring to life, like with a celestial brush. And then sometimes you get a platinum coin from it or something like that. I don't know what these platinum coins do though, it doesn't really tell you what they do anywhere, at least from what I've seen. A big compromise for this game as well is the fact that this game was very much made for the Wii U, so on Switch and PS4 and Xbox I believe, and maybe on even on PC. And because there's only one screen, the sub-screen that was on the Wii U is now in the corner of the main screen. Honestly, I think they could have done a better job with this, mainly with the menu screens. Sometimes you have to have two screens on at once, like there's sometimes, there's, I think there's once where you're in this like, you're in a building and you have to aim something at outside the building, but you need to, the other screen, um, the, the other screen that shows the top down view to see where you're aiming. That kind of thing can't be helped, that's the way the game was designed. But with the sub screens and stuff like that, you could have put that more in menus and made it not as clunky, I guess, because it feels like a half-hearted uh, effort to try and remedy that situation. But honestly, Wonderful 101, I had a really good time with it. Like I said, the camera, it can be frustrating in places, but it's a really fun game overall, and I 
I do actually want to go back to it. It's a really, really fun time. It's, bris it's a bit brisker than Astral Chain, for example, which was a bit of a longer game, but it's a bit longer than Bayonetta, so you've got a lot of fun to go through in this game. So, Wonder War 101 Remastered. Uh, I guess the V4 out of V5, I had a ton of fun with it. Uh, next up is a game that made me so unbelievably happy, and that is Bug Fables, The Everlasting Sapling. So this game is obviously a spiritual successor to the original Paper Mario formula. I'm very much a person who hated Sticker Star. That's probably my most hated game of all time, to be honest. Not because it's the worst game I've ever played, but just because it was so disappointing. I won't go into like hugely why I hate it here, but all I'll say is it was super cryptic. I wanted to love it so much that I actually really kind of liked the first two worlds. But then when the third world came around and the Wiggler split up and went everywhere, Hated it. Hated that game so much. And it's so disappointing because the first two Paper Mario games, I think, are masterpieces. I can't really pick between 64 and 1000 Year Door, of which one I like more. But I love them. I love them so much. The Super Paper Mario, I remember skipping because I, I saw it at a friend's house and I was like, why Why is he platforming? Like, why? Oh, I don't, oh, I don't like that. That's a bit weird. I own it now, but I'm going to play it at another point and I'll see how it goes because I've sort of got my head around that it's different now. Sticker Star's different, but it's a bad different. It's just a bad, 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 bad game. Don't like it. But this is the thing now because that game burnt me so badly on Paper Mario that unless it is exactly what I want it to be, I'm not bothered about Paper Mario anymore. And Bug Fables is what it should be because this game just took everything that Thousand Year Door did and improved on it. Um, in several areas, especially mainly the battle system and quests because my god the quest in this game But first off, let's talk about the story in Bug Fables because that is the thing that I think people obviously get it's, it, You know Paper Mario fans especially with the first two games. I guarantee you right now you will absolutely love this game But I do understand that you're looking at it thinking well, it's just bugs, like, how can that be interesting? And yes, it's not as interesting as the Mario world because Peg Mario, like, half the charm of it is from seeing the Mario world expanded and how Mario interacts with these characters. And Bug Fables isn't going to match that because it doesn't have the Mario moniker. But it does do a good job at what it does do and it's created its own world and lore with just bugs and it, they've made it really, really interesting. It, it does take a while to get into it, don't get me wrong, but like once you're into it and you see the characters develop, um, it's really engrossing. And there's side quests in this game which give other characters development and go into other people's backstories and it's such a expansive world because of these quests and that's like I said that's one thing that it does way better than Paper Mario straight away. The quests are just have more substance, they're more fulfilling and the rewards you get are great because in Thousand Year Door you had errands and the only thing substantial you'd really get from one of those errands is a new party member. Now in Bug Fables you don't really get new party members, there's like an there's kind of a new party member later in the game, but I won't spoil for that. It's, it, it's to do with a side quest. The main three you'll be focusing on are the three main characters, V, Kabu, and Leaf. And they gain new abilities throughout the game as well, so that's kind of how it, they don't introduce new power, uh, characters, but that you, you get new powers and stuff. And I, I really dug it because these three have such a good chemistry, especially later in the game when you see them, you know, how far they've come. And I like a little family. I love the secondary characters as well. I love, I love some of the plot twists as well. It's definitely not like a grand big JRPG extravaganza, but it's definitely a very um, enticing and engrossing story. And I think a, a big part of what makes this world so interesting is because your bugs. One of the areas in the game is that is a, a shed, but it's like an old abandoned shed in this garden that you're in because the whole world is in essentially in this garden. Like the desert is this big sandbox, but you don't know that until you've looked at the map. You'll see things in the sandbox that you're like, whoa, what the hell's that? And then you'll sit, look at the telescope over the world and you'll see, oh, it's a spade. It's done really, really well. Saying that though, the game can be quite bloated because of the quests, because there's so many quests that get you good stuff and because there's so many quests you want to do. This game does, I mean, it took me about nearly 50 hours to fully finish. That's not, 100% in it because I beat all the powerful beasts because the game is quite hard by the way If you're a veteran of the other Paper Mario games, you'll have a good challenge with this one Especially because it handles difficulty really well. It gives you a hard mode badge The more bosses you defeat on hard mode, the more cool badges you'll get as rewards So there's an incentive to play the game on hard, not just because it's bragging rights And you can turn hard mode off at any time So if you're you know struggling and you haven't got much health left or just beat a boss So you don't think another one's coming up for a while, you can turn hard mode off. It's no, you know, it's no biggie you will lose more um, experience points for that, but just the way you can toggle it on and off and get these rewards for it is amazing. And the music is incredible as well. My favourite tracks being Mecha B Destroyer and Oh No Wasps. It nails the way the first two Paper Mario games 
feel and sound. And it's very unique because the Paper Mario series is very unique in that aspect, but Bug Fables has managed to nail it. There's even been added DLC coming. I don't know if they're gonna add any big expansions or anything, but there's been DLC like now you can sprint, a few more quests added, because when I played you couldn't sprint in all directions. I mean I didn't really mind, but it was cool that they've added uh, this kind of thing so when I go back and play the game again I'll be able to experience all these cool things and I most certainly will be playing this game for get again and for years to come if you're a Paper Mario fan of the first two in any capacity I know you might think it might be a bit pricey on the eShop maybe because it is around £25 I mean you can wait for a sale if you want but I can tell you now that game is worth the money yes definitely pick it up Bug Fables the Everlasting Sapling absolutely gets a V5 Ooh, out of V5 so it was Clear as night and day, one of the best games i played this year. Now, next up, I kind of don't, I'm not pleased that I bought this game, but I almost am as well. It's Super Mario 3D All-Stars. So, this year was Mario's 35th anniversary, or last year, I suppose. It's 2021 now. What, what can I say? I'm bad at getting these uh, games of years out uh, on time. But it was his like, 35th anniversary last year and it was rumoured from the, thought that the start of the year really that he was going to get a collection of the 3D platforming games which are some of my favourite games of all time. Mario 64 is my favourite 3D Mario game of all time. Galaxy, I'm replaying it on that collection. I've come to learn that I might prefer the linear Mario structure now instead of the sandbox one. I don't know, that feels really weird to say because I was always really, really full of sandbox stuff. But maybe, maybe I'm older, maybe I'm just, I'm like, I want more things more simple now. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly God thought that this collection was going to be free remakes and it's not at all. It's Mario 64 with high definition and still 4x3. Super Mario Sunshine has got the most love, I would say. It's got widescreen now, it's also in HD. And actually, it got an update not too long ago to allow for full GameCube controller support, which is awesome. Mario Galaxy is also just an incredible game as well. I would say it's probably the most gimped version on this game though, because the way I played, you don't have to play it this way, by the way, but because you have the cursor on screen, I was playing with the two Joy-Cons because it sort of emulates the Wiimote and Nunchuk really well. But the gyro sensor is nowhere near as accurate as the Wii remote sensor so I'm constantly recalibrating it and like I said it wasn't a huge deal but it definitely was not the same now something that's cool is you can press a button to do Mario's little spin attack now you don't have to waggle the remote which took me a while to get used to as well but it wasn't huge it wasn't a huge deal don't get me wrong but it definitely wasn't the definitive way to play it I think the definitive way to play it is still the Wii version especially because when you're on a handheld when you're playing a Mario Galaxy handheld you have to use the touch screen to use the uh, cursor and it, I, I understand they couldn't really do too much more with that but it doesn't feel good doing that especially when you have to take your hand away from the camera control and the jump buttons and that and you have to fling your hands all over the screen not a big fan of that I've got to say a big thing has been leveled at this game's laziness and price I've been into collections like collecting collection games like game compilations quite a lot recently and this one is definitely one of the weakest ones I've seen it just doesn't have enough content in terms of like cele celebrate celeb Celebratory content. Nailed it. All it has is a really nice looking menu, admittedly, but it only has the three games and the sound player. Where's the art? Where's the legacy content? You know, where's the behind the scenes stuff? You know, all this thing, these things have been on other collections. Like, I recently got the SNK 40th anniversary collection. That's got a museum treasure trove of goodies there. Even almost like mini documentaries on how the cabinets came to be made and stuff like that. And all these games that have come out and how they were thought of at the time and artwork and just all these cool stuff. And Nintendo's so crappy with doing that kind of thing. They're trying to be so secretive, which is why I'm happy when stuff like the big leak came out a while ago about all like their um, 90s projects. And we need more of that because they're not going to do it themselves. So... <laughs> I, I approve. So unfortunately the collection is really lazy. It could have been a full remake. If it wasn't going to be a full remake, fair enough. I know some people have really gave the game's pricing some shit because it's around 40 to 50 pounds. Honestly, I can see where you're coming from because morally I don't think it should be that much, especially for how old the games are and how little that Nintendo have done to improve them or bring them up to, to date. More so with Sunshine and 64 Galaxies just always going to be a masterpiece, I think. In terms of, you know, if you went out and tried to buy these games on their original systems, this is actually a very good deal, especially if you find it for around £40. The limited availability is shit. Don't understand that at all. I mean, they're doing that, I guess, to sort of try and drive sales quicker. They've also started doing it with stuff like Fire Emblem and the, that Shadow Dragon localization now, so... 
I'm a bit scared about where this is going because it is ve really not good. Ve really, <laughs> it's really not good. And I, I can see it happening more, to be honest, especially with other companies as well. And yeah, uh, this game just doesn't set a lot of good things in motion, I don't think. But as a game itself, I do think it is worth the money. 64. While it's not the, the version I prefer, I mean, I, this can sound like sacrilege to some I know, but my childhood version of 64 was the DS version, so that's the one that I like. This one was fun to play through, you know, to see for like a history, historian's sake, but I still love the DS one over it no matter what. But it is the definitive way to play Sunshine, gotta give it that. It's just widescreen with the game controller, it, it looks great. Definitive way to play for sure, so not really much there. A Galaxy, although it's not as accurate as with the Wii Maker and Nunchuck, it's still a fantastic game, so I do think it's worth the money, but if you get it, you are supporting the limited availability thing, and I don't really want to give them money for that. And like I said, I can't talk, I'm a hypocrite in that sense, because I wasn't going to get the game until they said it's limited, then I was like, oh god damn it, you've, you've hit my collector's spot, now I need to get it. Honestly, if it was a good collection, it, I would love the game, um, but right now I am going to give it a V4 out of V5, because it's still got some of the best games ever made on it, can't fault it there, but the collection is disappointing, and morally, I think Nintendo have just fucked it up a bit here, but the game itself, like I said, still good, so yeah. So next up is a game that I've actually reviewed this shit, believe it or not. A new game reviewed by me, who knew? It's Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX. So like I said, I've always sort of done a video on this combined with the original Pokemon Mystery Dungeon uh, Red Rescue Team. You know, sort of comparing the changes, what I like and didn't like. So you can go watch that video for my full thoughts on it. Here I'll just say that I really did enjoy the game. I liked the, game, the way the game looked. I thought the game's soundtrack was redone perfectly. It really does feel like a handheld game and it was being sold for a very extortionate price. So yeah, I don't recommend buying it for anything over like 20 to 30 pounds, even then, that's a bit much I think. Because it's really not a lot different from the original game back on the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS. It does have some mechanical changes to bring it more up to date with how the 3DS games work. Sometimes for the better, like the IQ system, I think in this game is probably better with the amount of different uh, cool abilities you can get and it doesn't take as much grinding. But on the other hand though, I think the way they handled boss fights in this game was ridiculous i think they made they made the game more about the boss fight than the dungeon whereas before it was the dungeon that was fucking you over and bullshitting you and that was almost like an evil fun um you were overcoming the dungeon you fought a boss at the end yeah sure especially in the post game dungeons but in the remake it seems more about the dungeons aren't too hard but the bosses are the things you want to focus on which I think is the bad way to go about it because Mystery Dungeon does get a lot of crap for being monotonous and tedious and I think when you try and dumb down the dungeons more it makes it more obvious about it being tedious and monotonous. I, like I said, I still really enjoyed the game. I, give it a, I gave it a V3 out of V5 in my review and I'd probably still stick by that. I, I really have a lot of nostalgia for that original game and I did love playing through the remake and I will go back to it soon, I think, because like I said, Mystery Dungeon is just like, it's like comfort food for me. I don't really find it boring or tedious, I find it fun to play, so... And, and the story was really good in that game as well. I feel like they've done more in the remake to try and keep you playing for longer than the original, which felt like if you played smart, you could do whatever you wanted in that game, especially once the main game had been beaten. Whereas in the, in the, the remake, it does feel like they're trying to make you do a bit more grinding, which is weird because like in some aspects, like the IQ system, they haven't. They've also, you can see them, they've actually tried to um, increase the difficulty in the dungeons, you know, even though the dungeons aren't as hard as before, because for the options that are accessible to you like new moves and all that kind of thing they've still stuff done stuff like add traps to earlier dungeons they at least put the effort in to try and you can see that they have done that if you can get this game on the cheap definitely give it a go it's a really good entry point to the mystery dungeon series i'm really looking forward to the explorers remake if they do one of those i don't know if they will because i don't think rescue team the x soul particularly fantastic but I would love to see it because in this style because I would love to see what they would do with it and what they would keep. And I guess it's more out of curiosity than anything. But I do hope they make that game cheaper as well. So, yeah. So the last game for this year is Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. So this is the game that I finished most recently. And honestly, I think it is such a big improvement over the original Hyrule Warriors in almost every way. In terms of co-op, uh, probably not because the game still stutters like a bitch. Still not completely unplayable, but... Still not great, but honestly, after seeing the game's trailer and seeing the frame rate drops and stuff, I thought this game was going to be a bit iffy. 
And don't get me wrong, the frame rate drops are there and everything, but I forgot how little that matters in a game like this. It's the same in the original Hero Warriors as well, and this game, it does what the original Harrow's did well, like bringing the fan service and stuff, but not to the extent of making it almost like a fan fiction, I suppose. I'll tell you right now that this part of the video is probably going to have spoilers for Age of Calamity, just because there's characters and things that you might not expect to be here, but they are. So, and I'm going to show footage of that, so skip ahead to this timestamp to just hear my game of the year, or second game of the year, and the outro, because this part's going to contain spoilers, so there you go. The reason why this isn't really canon to Breath of the Wild is because it's essentially a separate timeline, because at the start of the game, you have this uh, little guardian called uh, Terrico, I believe. He travels back in time, somehow, and ends up altering the events of the past, and you do get a glimpse at what the battle with Ganon, uh, Calamity Ganon was like 100 years ago, but it's not the same kind of one. Terrico ends up bringing the descendants of the champions back with him so that they can save their um, ancestors. They're fighting the little blight ganons on uh, the divine beasts and all of a sudden there's like a big flash of light and the descendants pop out and they end up defeating these blight ganons. So now timeline has been uh, altered because the divine beasts were never under Ganon's control. And then you end up defeating Ganon and uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a brand new timeline. I, I honestly don't have too much wrong with it. I would have liked to have seen it actually be how it is, or at least have maybe a choice in the middle of the game where if you make one choice, it goes down this new timeline. But if you make another choice, it goes down the timeline that Breath of the Wild ends up being. Fortunately, there wasn't that. Um, or maybe make it a little extra thing in the post game because there is a little extra thing in the post game, but it's not really anything substantial. My only issue with the story, I suppose, is like. How the town shell thing isn't really explored, like you don't really ever learn about it, and I really, really, really doubt that Breath of the Wild 2 is going to have anything to do with Age of Calamity. It's definitely not going to follow that timeline. I don't think Nintendo would have a spin-off, like be that heavily involved with what they're making next. I don't think that's going to be the case. When you go into Age of Calamity, just take it for what it is, and that really honestly is fleshing out the characters of Breath of the Wild in ways that you didn't see in Breath of the Wild. In Breath of the Wild, they're just sort of there. You know, they've got hints of potential, but yeah. And I don't know what it is. Breath of the Wild's world is actually really interesting, despite it just being like a really simple post-apocalyptic um, setting. It's just really interesting for me, and they just didn't do a lot in the game to really explore that as much as I would have liked. But in Age of Calamity, it is kind of like that. They're, and they are exploring how the world got like this, and these characters that were so important in Breath of the Wild, but you couldn't really interact with like Impa when she's younger or the champions when they were alive there's so much good chemistry between these characters in this game and although the voice acting is better than it was in Breath of the Wild there's still some voices I cannot stand I really don't like Pur Pur Pura 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 her voice just sounds it doesn't sound right for the character the way the character looks I suppose some of the Zelda characters are so eccentric that I think that sometimes the voice acting just takes away from it a bit because the voice can't match how the character looks. Robbie's another one. I think his voice doesn't really match how eccentric his character looks or um, acts. It was good at first, don't get me wrong, but then eventually when you hear him talk more, you're like, oh, actually, maybe not the best. Uh, the standout star for this game, though, is Zelda and the champions, I'd say. It's all about her coming of age story, how she unlocks her power to, you know, seal the darkness and all that kind of thing. And honestly, the... I really do like these characters a lot more now. It's actually making me want to go back and play Breath of the Wild so I can appreciate them in their full glory. And that's the main reason to get Age of Calamity. If you're going in for it for its story, not don't think of it so much for the story, but think of it more for like the characters and how much more fleshed out they become. And don't get me wrong, they don't become insanely complex characters or anything, but there's more you see more of them and how they interact more with each other, and how these different dynamics work, and it just makes this world feel more alive and interesting because you get to see how these characters interact with each other and how they are with one another. Also the voice acting thing is Link's kind of just there, he doesn't really say out. It, I know that was also kind of a jarring thing in the original game. I, I don't know what to do with Link now, now th this is the direction they've gone in. I don't really know what to do with him because I don't want him to talk because of tradition's sake, but at the same time he's going to be a very hard character to feel connected to when he's just a plank of wood. <laughs> in terms of the gameplay, tons better than the original Hyrule Warriors. Now when you try and lock their weak point gauge, it does go down slower, but uh, there's more ways to unlock it, like you can use the wands or rod, uh, rods, 
from Breath of the Wild. So now when enemies are stood in water, you can use the electricity rod or ice rod to affect them and bring up their gauge, a strong, uh, strong enemy's gauge anyway. With other enemies, it just like electrifies them and stuff. You have the Sheikah rune slates, which anyone can use, and they all use them in different ways. Say like if Zelda uses the bomb, this big bomb will come up, and it's like a remote control bomb that shoots out other little bombs. But and if you're the Great Fairy, for example, which is a really cool like optional character, I I love them. You can. You bombard them by mashing the Y button. You'll just shoot bombs in the air, and they'll, they'll rain fire on the uh, on the enemies. So that's really cool. I like how different each character feels because that's a big thing that was uh, got a bit boring in the first game. Was how just how samey everyone felt. Everyone has the same control scheme in this game, but they all play differently. Zelda's a bit more of a slower character, and you have to set up stuff with her. Like she can uh, make these ice pillars, and then you can explode them later. But you can keep them there for you know a long time. Um, you can use the Magnesis one to have this little ball of energy above you. You can keep that up there and use it to extend combos. It's really cool. Some characters are really mashy. Uh, some characters you have to set up with. And I think they feel more diverse than they ever have in a Hyrule Warriors game for certain. I don't know about Warriors in general. But the game also is not as grindy as before either. Because the game is a lot more focused now. I will say overall it probably doesn't have as much content. But it has more substance to what's there. Honestly, Age of Calamity I had a really fun time with. I'll give it a V4 out of V5. There really wasn't too many shortcomings of the game to be honest so yeah uh, definitely look out for it because it's uh, it's a very underrated game at the moment I think. Age of Calamity was very very fun. So we've come to the game of the year we all know it's here by Chronicles Definitive Edition but after that what was my game of the year? Well honestly I'm really struggling to decide between Bug Fables and Hypnospace because those games both I both love them so so much but then I think about which one has stuck with me more after I've stopped playing it. And honestly, I'm going to just edge it out to Hypnospace. That game was, um, it just brings you in and into this wacky world. And actually, I didn't go on it too, I went on it uh, not long ago. Just to find this funny Raise Peak song, because it's about, just one of those weird um, advert songs. I mean, it sounds like this. You gotta drink it up. What can I say? I love that shit. But that's the kind of stuff that stuck with me and just hit close to home with me rather than Bug Fables, which, don't get me wrong, that hit close to home with me as well because it filled all my Paper Mario cravings as well. And both of them are absolute gems and masterpieces, I believe. So, yeah, I just edge it out to Hypnospace Outlaw. I cannot wait to see if they make... I don't know if they, if they made a second one. I don't think it would hit the same. But I would love to see an expansion of some sort or more cases because right now I'm just going back and just exploring still, exploring that world. Uh, Bug Fables, like I said, even that I was loving the expansion for. I can't wait to see the sequel of Bug Fables, though. So, But this year, overall, the quality of the games I thought was pretty good. For how few that I got, I played more good games this year than I did last year, even though last year I still loved all the games, I still liked all the games I played anyway, so. 2021, I honestly, if I had a wish list for it, I'd love to see what they're doing next with Xenoblade. I don't know if we'll get another Xenoblade game uh, anytime soon because we've got the remake this year, so maybe that's just something they were doing to tide us over. But I'd love to see what they're doing next with Xenoblade 3 or even X2. I'd love another X game. Or even if they put X on the Switch, that'd be really cool as well. I'd also love to see Breath of the Wild 2 come out this year. And I also would like to see, obviously, how, what they're doing on Metro Prime 4. In terms of third-party stuff, I honestly don't know. Whatever they fling out, and I'll uh, I'll have a look at. I did see a game called Eastwood, a little indie game called Eastwood, and that was supposed to come out last year. But I never saw anything about it, so I think that's probably been delayed. I would love also to see what the DLC for Katana Zero is, because I can understand that taking a while to make, because it was only one guy making it, but I don't think there's really been any other updates on the DLC yet, so I'd love to see that as well. But I guess that's my wish list for 2021. Oh, also a Switch Pro. I am in desperate need now to get a more powerful Switch. So yeah, those were my games of 2020, guys. Hopefully the next year can be a good one as well. I honestly don't know what will be my game of the year this year, because... 
uh, there's not really any games that have come out this year yet that I'm thinking about playing. There's nothing on my radar. So we'll see where we are next year. So once again, thanks for watching, guys. Take care.